can you easily tell when the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate with you? Is there any time in your life when you felt the Holy Spirit was leading you but you weren't too sure? Have you ever been made to doubt God's voice because of uncertainty and you're beginning to wonder how you can recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit? Today, in this video, we'll discuss four signs that reveal the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. God has a plan for us, but too many believers fall short of this plan. This occurs when we do not know the voice of the Holy Spirit. Many voices cloud our minds, making the voice of the Holy Spirit too difficult for us to discern. It could be the voice of your flesh, mind, friends, circumstances, spouse, parents, or even the devil. However, being able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit will give us an upper hand over these other voices. First of all, you need to know that the voice of the Lord will always be that still, small voice. No, not always. The Holy Spirit speaks to us in different ways. There is no one way to His expression. God cannot be boxed. Psalm 29 verse 1 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. 1 Kings 19, 12-13 also says, And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. Now that you know that, what then are the signs you'll see when the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you? The number one is an uneasiness in your spirit. A conviction in your spirit expressed by your conscience is like a stop sign being put up by the Holy Spirit. It is His way of telling you to stop right where you are or stop a particular action and not proceed further. The Bible says in Acts 16, 6-7, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus will not allow them to. Paul and his companions were trying to preach the gospel to every city they visited, but the Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching in Asia. Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Is Asia not a place worthy to receive the words of God? The Holy Spirit kept them away from this place and disallowed them from entering Bithynia. This might be because there is a danger in those places that Paul and his colleagues might not be aware of, or it might be due to other reasons best known to God. What they experienced was a check in their spirits. Only God knows what would have happened to them if they had disobeyed the Holy Spirit. You may be watching this video now and feel an uneasiness in your spirit about not going out today. You might be wondering what this could be, but this may be the Holy Spirit trying to call for your attention. It could also be strong convictions about something. You suddenly feel convinced that something is not right. All these are promptings from the Holy Spirit, perhaps to save your life from danger. How many people have died in car accidents and plane crashes all because they choose to ignore the uneasiness in their spirits not to get in that car or travel that day? Possibly they ignored it, thinking that it was their emotions and fear and that it was not coming from the Holy Spirit. If this type of sign is coming to you, don't take it for granted. It is the Holy Spirit trying to communicate to you. The number two is through His leading. According to Romans 8.14, the Bible says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. If you are a genuine child of God, the Holy Spirit will always be there to lead you. He will lead you on what to do and what not to do, on where to go and where not to go. These leads can be anything from a very gentle nudging to something that could be much stronger. When you get a strong lead to do something specific, it will feel like God has his big hand on the small of your back pushing you forward. You will sense a strong unction, a forceful prompting to move in that direction. It could even come in the form of a repetitive idea, and that's one thing about the leading of the Holy Spirit. It will keep coming over and over again until you are able to discern that it's from God. You will learn to pick up these promptings from the Holy Spirit through trial and error. After you have received quite a few of these leadings from the Holy Spirit, 
You can become adept at telling when a leading is coming directly from him or when it is coming from your natural desires and emotions. Do you have a strong desire to buy that house? Do you feel the prompting to relocate to that city or a strong feeling of abstaining from that person? Do not hesitate, as this is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. The number three is through dreams. Dreams are so common that many Christians have grown up not respecting them as a valid method of God's leading. Surprisingly, God teaches us that the coming of the Holy Spirit will inspire new dreams in our lives. In Acts 2.17, the Bible says, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. This scripture shows that dreams come from the presence of the Holy Spirit. From today, do not take dreams lightly. This, however, does not discount the fact that dreams can come from sources besides the Holy Spirit. Some might be due to your emotions or what has happened in the day. Some might even come from the devil himself. Evil forces can even manipulate your dreams, which mustn't be taken lightly. However, know today that many dreams result from the presence of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you may wake up in the morning with an unusual dream. It may be that God is trying to get your attention. If you look at Jesus' birth and early years, you will discover how dreams played an important role in the lives of Joseph and Mary. A dream led Joseph to stick with Mary, even though she was found to be pregnant before they got married. A dream also directed Joseph to flee into Egypt for the safety of the baby Jesus. Because Joseph obeyed, Jesus escaped the slaughter of babies ordered by Herod. This means the Holy Spirit can speak to us in a dream. When you wake up and remember your dream so clearly, this might be coming from the Holy Spirit. If you struggle to remember your dreams, take them to the Lord in prayer and He will help you remember. Another sign is restlessness and lack of peace. If there's one major sign God employs to get our attention, it is the loss of peace. As a child of God, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, and proof of His presence in your life is the peace He gives you. Philippians 4.7 and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is a state of calmness in your spirit. The presence of peace often confirms the presence of God in a situation. But the moment this peace is absent, it signals trouble, and the right thing to do is to run to God for clarity. God always works with your peace. If it is a step that God does not want you to take, He will cease your peace. When your peace is not present, you will feel discomfort about taking that step. You might not be able to decide for what's going on, but you will just suddenly become uneasy. God can make you restless when He needs you to intercede and alert you to a forthcoming danger. If He does not want you to take that trip at that particular time, He will let you know through the restlessness you'll feel in your spirit. So, if everything for that journey is set but your peace is not, it could be a signal from God. Do you know that peace is also a channel God uses to heighten your sensitivity? It is like a traffic light that tells you exactly when you need to stop, prepare to get on the move, or begin the journey. He works through your peace to help you discern what He thinks about the issues of life. One way to recognize that God guides you is by observing how you feel after following His instructions. You will no longer experience uneasiness but a sense of restored peace. When you find that you suddenly feel discomfort about a certain deal that you are about to put a seal to, a travel plan, or meeting up with a certain person, he might be saying, do not go, wait, or I am preparing you for another thing. That is God trying to get you to see something you can't see. The last sign is a repetitive word from God. God is not limited when it comes to finding ways to communicate his ideas to you. He always devises a means to send his message. His word is a major channel through which he gets you to see what he wants. It could be a certain topic or idea that keeps coming to mind. He could even direct you to scriptures that explain what he has been bringing to your thoughts. Within that same season, you will also find that he uses everything to speak to you. Unplanned, you might stumble upon a TV show, podcast, or song discussing that theme. If this is happening to you, God is trying to get your attention. The Holy Spirit can communicate with you by giving you a direct verse from the scripture. You will notice that the meaning of that verse becomes clear to you, and it might even be the answer to the particular issue or dilemma you may be dealing with. When you discover that God is giving any of the signals discussed, do not ignore them. If you choose not to pay attention, especially when they come repeatedly, 
you might miss out on something important that God is about to bring to manifest in that season of your life. Do you desire to experience the workings of the Holy Spirit in you? Do you doubt if the Holy Spirit is in you? Yes, every Christian receives the Holy Spirit as a promise from the Father, but you may not enjoy a relationship with Him if you're unaware of His presence. The truth is, if you don't realize you have something, you'll either misuse it or never use it. How, then, will you know that the Holy Spirit lives in you? To enjoy a beautiful fellowship with the Holy Spirit, there are signs that indicate His presence within you. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit makes it possible for you to live a righteous life. Without His help, living a life free of sin will be difficult. This is why you'll notice that whenever you're about to sin, the Spirit of God nudges you, reminding you who you are, what to do and what not to do. The work of the Holy Spirit is in you to make you like Jesus, so He'll stand against whatever wants to hinder that work within you. You can't deny the internal check that informs you when you're doing the wrong thing. It's only that you sometimes pretend not to hear what He's saying. Although the Holy Spirit does the work of conviction, you also have the duty of yielding to Him. When you mistakenly touch a hot surface, your hands quickly move away because your brain senses that there's danger. This is how the nudge of the Holy Spirit comes. Immediately, when you think of doing something against His will, you'll get a warning that you're not on the right path. The inward witness is a way to know that the Holy Spirit is in you, and you must ensure that you watch out for it and not harden your heart when the nudge comes. When you do things you can't do naturally, the Holy Spirit is within you. With the Holy Spirit, you can do the supernatural. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives you the power to lay your hands on the sick and cast out demons from the demonized. When Jesus was on the earth, He did the miraculous because He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. The Holy Spirit made Jesus perform wonders, and this is the same thing Jesus wants you to do. If you pray for the sick and they get healed, it's because you have the Holy Spirit. It didn't happen by chance. Don't let the devil trick you into believing it's normal for it to happen. Nothing happens without a cause. When you become more aware of the work of the Holy Spirit, He becomes more expressive in your life. Aside from this, He also grants you supernatural strength. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. After a long day of work, it's natural to feel stressed, but if you still need to do other things despite your weakness, you can draw supernatural strength from the Holy Spirit. No matter how weak you feel, you'll be refreshed and energized when the Holy Spirit strengthens you. One of the ways the Scripture describes the Holy Spirit is by calling Him the water of life. This means that inside you, you have what can keep you alive, quench your thirst, and refresh you when you get weary. There is a longing in the heart of every man, and the longing is to find satisfaction and happiness. Those who are not believers try to find it in the world. Unfortunately, the world gives temporary satisfaction. The Holy Spirit gives true satisfaction, so anyone with Him doesn't need to search for happiness elsewhere. He is the water that quenches our thirst and never runs dry. Those filled with the Spirit are always satisfied, irrespective of where they find themselves. To be satisfied doesn't mean to settle for less. It means to be at peace with where you are. Nothing truly satisfies except Jesus through His Spirit. Are you always satisfied and content? Then you have the Holy Spirit in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living within you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. As long as we are in this body, there are limitations to what we can do. Except the Holy Spirit quickens us, we won't be able to do some things. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is your enablement. He is your strength when you become weak. How can one man maintain strength in the face of adversity? It's only possible through the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comforts and strengthens a believer when things are difficult. A believer who yields to the Holy Spirit won't consider committing suicide because he knows that the Lord is always with him whether times are hard or not. 
The Holy Spirit plants your feet solidly in God by creating an atmosphere of joy irrespective of the problem. He is the proof of the presence of God, and wherever the presence of God is, there is peace and joy. This is why David said that even though he walks through the darkest valley, he will fear no evil because God is with him. So if you seem to be at peace irrespective of what's happening in your life, that is the Holy Spirit working in you. Many would only keep wondering why you're not moved by your current situation. The Holy Spirit is the greatest support system you can have, such that what makes people give up will have little or no effect on you. This is the secret to those who rise above challenges. They have learned to allow the Holy Spirit to help them. Not all believers live this kind of life. It is reserved only for those who have acknowledged the Holy Spirit as their helper. Have you ever been at a crossroad, confused about what to do when a voice suddenly whispers in your ear, or the solution suddenly comes as an inspiration? The voice you hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit, and that's how He can help you in difficult situations by providing you with solutions. You shouldn't have the Holy Spirit and be stranded or confused because He is there to help you. The Holy Spirit also helps you to pray more effectively. It can be difficult to stay long in the place of prayer if the Holy Spirit doesn't help you. You can get tired or fall asleep along the way. This is because the flesh doesn't like these activities. Therefore, it will always stand in your way when you engage in spiritual exercises. However, the job of the Holy Spirit in these times is to help you look beyond the longing of the flesh and make you fulfill the desire of the Spirit. Those who can do the things of the Spirit are those who have yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit. If you can spend hours in prayer or in your quiet time, it's because the Holy Spirit is at work within you. The Scripture told us of how Jesus went with three of His disciples to pray in Gethsemane. Jesus was able to stay long in prayers while the disciples couldn't because they were weak. On the day of Pentecost, after receiving the Holy Spirit, those who were weak in the place of prayer became energetic. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Yes, that's one of the great works of the Holy Spirit, to guide you into all truth. Having the Holy Spirit in your life enables you to make the right decisions. There are times when we can tell that a decision is right or wrong or what doesn't seem right. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes certain decisions look like they'll profit you, but the Holy Spirit might not agree with it, and if you obey, you'll be glad you did. Following the instructions of the Holy Spirit can save you from a lot of losses or troubles. When the Holy Spirit begins to warn you of certain choices you're about to make, don't wave them aside thinking it's just a mere thought. Instead, heed His warning. This is also a way to train your ears to hear Him because the more you obey Him, the more of His voice you will hear. Above all, the Holy Spirit bears fruit in your spirit man. The manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, is a powerful way to know you have the Holy Spirit. Because they are fruits, everyone can see them. Therefore, the best way to know you have the Holy Spirit is to watch what people have to say about you. How much love do you show your neighbor or even your enemy? How patient are you in the face of challenges? Can people testify of how good and kind you are? These are questions you should ask yourself. People are supposed to see Jesus in you. They agree that you have the Holy Spirit when they see His fruits in your life. This is very important because even Jesus cares so much about our fruits. As much as the Holy Spirit wants to always be with you and talk to you, it is possible to quench His Spirit by disobeying His voice. This is a dangerous state for any believer to be. The Holy Spirit has a gentle nature, which means that He will never force anything on you, so ensure you yield to His leadings. The role of the Holy Spirit in a believer is more than we can number. He is our helper, comforter, advocate, teacher, and more. Because of His numerous abilities, it's possible to limit Him to areas that you want. However, it's best to allow Him to reveal Himself to you in all capacities. Remember that the Holy Spirit is here to ease your journey of life and to make you walk in alignment with God's will. Always reach out for help whenever you need and allow Him to guide you at every point in your life. Over the years, one of the most important 
yet confusing teachings ever is the subject of how God speaks to His children. Truly, hearing and discerning God's voice can look mystical at first, but it's possible. It is one of the sweetest things that can happen to you as a Christian. The ability to know and understand God's voice, like His sheep, as stated in the Scripture, is one of every Christian's prayers. Yes, you too can hear God, but the question here is, are you ready to listen and be familiar with His voice? Because for many, God has been speaking, but they aren't patient enough to listen. Now let's look at four ways God can speak to you and how you can understand the way He speaks. God speaks through His still small voice in our hearts. This is perhaps the hardest of all the ways that God speaks to us because it requires stillness of the heart to pick up this voice amidst the multitude of noise around us daily. It equally takes time to understand and be able to discern the voice of God. Interestingly, other spirits could speak. Even your mind and emotions speak to you. If care is not taken, you may end up not differentiating His voice from the voice of your troubled mind or the voices of men. Until your soul is quieted, you will not be able to understand and discern the voice of God. The act of prayer is a form of communicating with God, but how did we end up making it a one-sided communication? Why do we only do the talking in the place of prayer? We confess our heart's desires, share the grace, and immediately move on to the next action for the day. No, this isn't right. How do you expect God to speak? How do you expect to learn and discern His voice when you hardly spend time listening quietly in His presence? Since prayer is a communication between you and God, it is important you speak and also allow Him to speak. This may seem strange at first, but it's an attitude worth cultivating. Stay in the place of prayer and give time for God to talk back. Those questions you asked while praying, God is sincerely ready to answer. But when you immediately get carried away with other activities of your life after prayers, you won't hear a word he has to say or see the vision he wants you to see. Now, how do you discern God's still, small voice amidst the multitude of voices in your heart? First, build a relationship with God. When you build a relationship with God, you become his friend, and it makes it easy for you to relate to his voice. When you walk in intimacy with God, you will even understand the beatings of his heart. When you establish a good relationship with God, you will not always need your pastor to tell you what God is saying. You will be sensitive to God and His ways. John 10.27 NIV says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Second, be expectant and attentive. God is always speaking. The question is, are you attentive to know when He is speaking? You don't need to cajole God to speak. You're the one to stay attentive at all times to listen and grasp His voice. If you asked Him a question this minute, keep an attentive ear throughout that hour, day, week, or as long as possible to know what He says. Being attentive and expectant does not mean you should put a hold on all your daily activities while waiting for God to speak. No. It simply means that your heart should be receptive and stay sensitive at all times, even while going about your daily activities. Third, be discerning. We need to know that many things and many voices are vying for our attention. We need to be aware that not all voices are of God. God, Satan, and ourselves are the three major voices trying to speak. God's voice is calm, it brings peace and satisfaction. It doesn't give you a troubled mind, and neither is it trying to force you. He talks and keeps still to allow you the choice of obeying Him or not. On the other hand, Satan's voice sounds too convincing, like he's trying to push you to act fast. While your voice always sounds emotional, it is always wanting you to go the emotional way. Let's take a practical example. Imagine you are praying for God to show you the right person to get married to between Steve and Harry. 
God's voice may quietly say Steve is the one and also confirm it through his written word or other people around you. Because God must always confirm his word. Satan's voice will keep saying Harry with so much force like he wants you to act fast or else you will lose out. His voice always tries to sound too convincing. And your voice? It will come up with words like, you know you love Harry more, right? He is handsome and your children will turn out beautiful. He is also tall and responsible and he can shoulder the family's responsibilities. Exactly. Your voice keeps going so emotional and sentimental. God's voice will not only convince you of material and emotional benefits, but keep you abreast of eternal and future consequences. His voice will keep you at peace even if it doesn't tally with what your heart desires. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the end right from the beginning. God speaks to us through His Word, the Scripture. The Scripture, the authoritative Word of God, is time-tested and historically approved as a medium God speaks to us. The commonest place that God speaks to His children is through the Scripture. The Bible describes the Word of God as a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. That means in His Word, we get directions for life. Through the Word, you can get the illumination needed for the fulfillment of your purpose and everyday living. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. NIV. Beyond the written letters of His words, He ministers to our hearts as we read His word with understanding and meditate carefully. If you cannot perceive the voice of God speaking directly to your heart through His word, you may want to check your heart to know if you are still in the right standing with Him. If you will need to rededicate your life back to Him to enjoy this union with Him, please do it now. The Bible is one of God's provisions to help equip us to do His will. God's Word is alive. It is active in our lives. The Bible is an essential part of your walk with God. You must not neglect His Word. Read the Word, memorize the Word, and meditate on the Word of God. By His Holy Spirit who dwells in each believer, God will focus your attention on particular verses or passages. They will have specific applications to your life as regards situations you are facing, character goals you are working on, questions you have, or pressures you are experiencing. As you meditate on those verses to which the Spirit of God leads you and obey them, God will guide you in paths of righteousness. Psalms 23.3 NIV says, He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Honoring and obeying God's word is the key to hearing God's voice. Through obedience, we demonstrate our love for God, and failure to obey is a reflection of a rebellious heart. If we resist His word, our fellowship with God will be limited. The third way God speaks to us is through a sense of peace. This particular medium cannot be overemphasized. Peace is the blessing of God that transcends all human understanding. It is the calmness of your spirit, mind, and body that supersedes all human interpretation. It strengthens your faith and gives you the courage to move on. The inner calmness you feel regardless of what is going on around you means that God is with you in that particular situation. Lastly, God speaks to us through other believers in the faith and circumstances. God is not limited in any way. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is sovereign. God will speak even if you decide to close up other means through which He speaks to you. The Bible records many instances in which God used one individual to deliver His message to another individual. Remember, He once spoke through a donkey in Scripture. God may even choose to speak to you through a friend, a parent, a pastor, or a stranger. Rather than dismiss their words, it would be wise to confirm what you hear by praying about it or seeking co-believers who can give you godly counsel in your local church. Even if your fellow church members do not directly give you counsel, God can use their words to reveal or confirm His will. 
Don't worry about how that will be. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is filled with accounts of God speaking to individuals, families, and nations. In the past, He spoke in many different ways, and that is true today as well. Play your part by listening attentively and being sensitive to His moves. Many believers fear that they might easily confound God's voice with that of the devil. Well, just as you can never confound the voice of your earthly father with that of a stranger, God's children can confidently identify His voice when He speaks. The way to avoid deception is to learn to recognize God's voice well. Then, if Satan tries to counterfeit God's voice, you will immediately recognize it as a deception. Build your relationship with God. Invest in your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Read, study, and meditate on Scripture. Make yourself available to God through prayer. Worship the Lord. Be still in His presence. Heed the godly counsel of trustworthy fellow believers. As you do all these, you will never miss out on hearing God's voice. There is no shortcut to learning to recognize God's voice, just as there is no shortcut to maturing from infancy to adulthood. It takes time. Do you want to hear God's voice? Then spend more time with Him. Even your Christian journey demands discipline and commitment. The depth of your walk with God is directly proportional to the level of your discernment. If you seek after God in a half-hearted, inconsistent manner, you cannot expect to hear Him speaking at the deepest levels. But if you will discipline yourself to concentrate on the Lord, and if you diligently obey everything He says, then you will be prepared to experience God at an increasingly profound and personal level. God speaks to us in a variety of different ways. He speaks through nature, through people, events, the Bible, etc. But sometimes it can be hard to tell that God is speaking to you. You may be listening for His voice and simply not hearing it, or you may not even be listening at all. But if you take a moment and assess your life, you may find that He is speaking loud and clear. When you see things in your life begin to fall into place, God may be telling you that you're on the right path. Conversely, when things begin to fall apart in your life, God may be directing you to a different path. When you see repeated patterns in a biblical message or verse, God could be trying to send you a message. Keep an eye out for all those things to determine whether God is speaking to you and what He's trying to say. Do you ever find yourself thinking, this is too good to be true? We've all heard stories of people who move to a new country with nothing and find themselves with a great house, church, and friends in no time. And we've heard of success stories where people quit their day job to pursue their dreams and everything works out better than they had ever hoped. Maybe you've had an experience like this for yourself. When everything in life seems to fall into place, we get suspicious and wonder when something will go wrong. But it could be a sign that God is speaking to you and telling you that you're on the right path. Consider the story of Ruth, for example. Ruth left her homeland to accompany her late husband's mother to Bethlehem. Ruth could have remained in Moab and remarried, but she chose to remain loyal to Naomi and stay by her side instead. When Ruth went to the fields to glean behind the harvesters, she happened to be working in Boaz's field and he took notice of her. He commanded his men not to lay a hand on her and to ensure that she gleaned enough for herself and Naomi. Naomi then revealed to Ruth that Boaz was the family's kinsman redeemer, responsible for taking over the manly duties of their family. Ruth gained Boaz's favor and he agreed to marry her and take care of Naomi. They eventually had a son and gave Naomi a grandchild. This story could have gone very differently. If Ruth had chosen to glean in any other field, she may have never met Boaz. She may have been abused in the fields and struggled to provide for her and Naomi. She may even have eventually decided to return to Moab. But that's not what happened. God directed Ruth to Boaz's field and made Boaz take notice of her. He ensured that Ruth was protected and that she and Naomi were well cared for when Ruth and Boaz married. He even gave Ruth a son who was a descendant of David and eventually Jesus. Everything fell neatly into place once Ruth decided to follow Naomi to Bethlehem because that was the path that God had chosen for her. She rejected her old life and chose to serve Naomi's God and remain loyal to her former mother-in-law, and God rewarded her for it. 
She guided Ruth every step of the way to encourage her to continue on the path, and that's what she did. And Ruth isn't the only one with a success story. Another great example of this comes from the book of Esther. When King Xerxes got rid of the queen and began to search for a new one, Esther probably never dreamed that it would be her. She presented herself with all the other young women who wanted the crown. And after months of beauty treatments and preparations, she was finally presented to the king. And he liked her. Not only did he like her, but he made her queen. He favored Esther more than every single other girl who had been presented. Esther must have wondered why she gained the position, but she couldn't have known the reason then. But as we read her story, it becomes clear. The king was unaware that Esther was Jewish, and when he allowed Haman to issue a decree that the Jews would be killed, Esther was the only one who could possibly do anything to stop it. She used her position to approach the king and beg for mercy for her people. And the king granted her request. Thousands of Jews were saved and Haman was sent to the gallows. Esther's life seemed too good to be true, but it was all part of God's plan. He placed Esther exactly where he wanted her to be. She was on the path that God chose for her. She softened the king's heart towards her so that he would not only pick her as queen, but also listen to her plea for mercy and grant it. When things fall into place in your life, don't simply take it for granted. Take a step back and try to determine if God is speaking to you through these life events. Think about what He's trying to say and where He's guiding you. Open your heart to His guidance and continue to follow the path that He has set out for you. There is no telling what amazing things the Lord could accomplish through you just like He did with Ruth and Esther. On the other hand, many of us have experienced moments when our lives seem to be falling apart. We're often tempted to think that God has abandoned us when this happens, but the case may be the opposite. God may be speaking to you by guiding you onto a different path than the one you're on. He may be trying to tell you that you're not where you're meant to be. A clear example of this is found in the book of Jonah. God instructed Jonah to preach to the Ninevites and warn them of upcoming destruction as a result of their sin. But Jonah was afraid to do as God commanded. Instead of going to Nineveh, he boarded a ship for Tarshish and tried to escape God's plan for him. But the ship encountered a storm and it became clear that Jonah was the reason for it. When he realized that there was no other way to calm the storm, he told the crew that they must throw him overboard. As soon as they did so, the waters calmed and became safe once more. Jonah may have expected to drown in the sea, but his story wasn't over. God caused a large fish to swallow him up and Jonah lived in its belly for three days. During that time, he repented of his sin. When the fish threw Jonah back up onto dry land, he was prepared to go to Nineveh. When he preached there, the people were afraid of God's wrath and they repented of their sins and begged for mercy. God rescinded his judgment and Nineveh was saved from destruction. Jonah thought he could escape God's plan for him, but it wasn't as easy as he expected. His life immediately began to fall apart as soon as he deviated from God's plan, but God guided him back to him again. God made it clear to Jonah that he had chosen the wrong path and he guided him onto the right one. When your life seems to be falling apart, don't turn away from God. Instead, turn towards Him and listen to what He's trying to say. Pray for clarity and wisdom, as well as the courage to leave the path you're on and follow Him where He wants you to go. Open your heart to the Lord and allow Him to guide you. If Jonah hadn't gone to Nineveh, thousands of lives would have been lost. God used him to save lives and bring others back to Him. You never know what God could use you for if you continue down the wrong path. God may also speak to you through repeated patterns. He may cause a particular verse to jump out at you. You may open your Bible to it one day, hear the same verse preached the next day, and hear a friend repeat it shortly after that. Or you may be listening to a worship song and resonate with a lyric that keeps popping into your head all the time. You may hear the same message repeated over and over through friends, preachers, or even in seemingly random places like on the radio or even a billboard. God can speak to you anywhere through anything. His power is not limited. If you notice a particular verse, mantra, lesson, or whatever it may be, appearing over and over again, don't ignore it. Stop and take notice. Ask yourself why God may be directing you towards it and allow Him to speak to you through it. Pray for understanding so that you'll know what he's saying. 
you may be tempted to chalk the repetitions up to coincidence. And in some cases, that may be all it is, but in others, it might be more serious. God is the creator of the universe, and He has the power over all things. He directs what we see and when we see it. Everything we encounter is for a reason, and we must ask God what that reason is. The Lord is our shepherd, and we must follow Him and listen to His voice. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. When you choose to listen to God's voice and follow Him wherever He leads, you are choosing eternal life. You're choosing protection and love. When a hired hand takes care of the sheep, He doesn't care about them, and He'll run away when a wolf threatens. But Jesus is our shepherd, and He will lay down His life for His sheep. He knows each and every one of us, and He loves us more than we could ever imagine. When we belong to the Lord, we belong to Him forever. There's nothing that can separate us from His love. If you want to receive this love and protection, then listen for His voice. When life is going well, listen to what He's saying. When life isn't going well, listen to what He's saying. When you hear something over and over, listen to His words. Listen to God's voice and follow the Great Shepherd wherever He leads you. He will protect you and keep you safe, and you will receive eternal life in heaven as a reward. Imagine you got the opportunity to meet and dine with the President of the United States. Plus, you're to come with a list of all your needs and every situation you would want him to sort out with his position and authority. Would you throw this opportunity away? How would you treat this opportunity? You see, surrendering to God is the only opportunity you have to get God involved in all aspects of your life. It is a spiritual concept that involves letting go of one's will, desires, and needs for control and entrusting them all to a higher power. There was a time when I lived my life based on my terms and wisdom. I did not know the benefits of surrendering to God. Even if I knew, I probably did not know how to go about it. In those seasons, I bore my burdens. I carried weights that I shouldn't have, and I was always depressed and never smiling because I thought God hated me for punishing me with so many problems. My life was a perfect definition of worry and anxiety. But to be honest, many of those problems were self-inflicted because they were consequences and mistakes I got into when trying to figure things out myself. Now, I know that surrendering to God is acknowledging and accepting that there are aspects of life, destiny, and existence beyond my control. It also means handing over to God the things I hold most dear. It means not holding on tightly to my ideas of what will bring me happiness, but trusting that He knows the best for me and you. He knows the desires of our hearts and will give us a fulfilled life. Surrendering entails a deep sense of trust, faith in God, and willingness to align one's actions with His divine will or plan. And the most amazing part? It draws you closer to God. Ever since I came to the knowledge of that truth, my life took a sporadic turn. Beloved, words can't describe the profound peace that comes with knowing He will take care of me. Psalm 37.5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. That's the simplest definition of surrendering to God. Commit your ways to Him. But that's not all. Permit me to share five illuminating insights I wish I had known earlier on this transformative path called surrendering. The first thing surrendering to God taught me was to release total control. It is an act of relinquishing control, not just out of weakness, but of trust. In a world where we often strive to manage time, manage workflow, and manage every aspect of our lives, surrendering teaches us that true productivity and success lie in letting go. That's the secret to finding serenity in this chaotic world. We sometimes claim to have submitted our lives to God, but we are still in control. We know we are in charge because we make every decision ourselves. We cannot claim to have surrendered to God when we are still in charge. If we do so, our confessions and actions contradict each other. 
It's like dropping the list of your needs on the president's table and picking it up after a few minutes, because you think he's not acting immediately or how you wanted him to. Beloved, if you can drop your list with God, leave it permanently there. I wish I had known this early enough. What I did normally was to cast my cares upon the Lord and then pick them up sometime later. No, let us learn to leave everything at the feet of Jesus. Let us learn to not be in charge anymore. Our surrendering is incomplete if we do not let God lead us afterward. Releasing control when surrendering involves a conscious and intentional shift in perspective and behavior. It requires us to recognize that there is a purpose beyond our immediate understanding and trust that things will unfold just as God wants them to. The second thing I wish I had known about surrendering earlier in my journey of faith is the possibility of attaining peace and uncertainty. To be honest, we feel light after surrendering to God because He now bears our weight. But when we decide to engage in worry and anxiety, we take back our weight, and then we lose joy and peace. More often, we do not lose peace because things didn't go the way we expected, but because we went ahead of God to handle the things we surrendered to Him at some point. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. According to this Bible verse, presenting your requests to God implies surrendering them to Him. Peace comes with doing this, but the moment we begin to take things into our own hands, we lose our inner peace. Life is inherently unpredictable, filled with twists and turns that challenge our plans. Surrendering to God grants us an unfathomable sense of peace amid uncertainty. Thirdly, beloved, when you understand that not everything is meant to be understood or controlled, it brings a sense of calmness. Certain aspects of a believer's life are not meant to be controlled. They are meant to be surrendered instead. Anything that causes worry should not be controlled, but rather surrendered. It is important to understand this biblical truth, which is why his scriptures instruct us to cast our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. The biblical strategy to wage war against some problems in our lives is to cast them upon the Lord and go rest, for therein lies our peace. What else did I learn? Surrendering is not passive, at least not for a believer in Christ. It is an action word, in active alignment with God. This simple act reveals the purpose in every struggle and adversity. It helps us realize that there is a divine solution beyond our immediate comprehension and our role is to let go and let Him be God. You may have been living without a sense of purpose, but I tell you, the moment you empty yourself to Jesus, He begins to help you see things the way He does. He helps you see the solution you've been struggling to fathom. He helps you see the opportunities in your problem. Technically, this is where the sense of peace and purpose comes from. It comes from our changed perspectives and our transformed minds. Many are still troubled, walking aimlessly and still making little progress because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. They are still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work. If you want to remain like this, you can never see God's purpose in your struggles. For you to know that the trial of your faith works patient endurance in you, you need to have surrendered to God, or else you will argue with Him. Arguing with God is synonymous with questioning His will and insisting that you want things done your way rather than inquiring about His purpose behind everything that happens to you. When I begin to surrender, I begin to live and walk by purpose. I begin to ask God questions like, why do I need to go through this? Knowing why contributes to our peace and uncertainty and ultimately gives us a sense of purpose. You see that lightness that almost every one of us felt when we first gave our lives to Jesus. It is real, and it can and should be our reality every day. We felt light, renewed, and refreshed because we just surrendered our lives to Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. The moment we begin to take our lives into our hands, we immediately begin to feel heavy again. Beloved, these unnecessary burdens, whether they are regrets from the past, anxieties about the future, or the weight of current challenges, can be alleviated through surrender. 
Matthew 11:28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Save yourself the stress. There is a better way to go about your burdens. Don't seek to be in control. Surrender them to Jesus. Burdens will not siege for as long as a man lives. That is because they are a part of life. Surrendering to God is acknowledging that we do not have to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. Surrendering allows us to exchange our heavy loads for a lighter spirit and deeper connection with God. I have become a better person since I began practicing the act of casting my cares upon Jesus. By better, I mean I am happier and more fulfilled. The weight of our problems is enough to make a 30-year-old look 50. That's not the kind of life God wants us to live. He wants us to live happy lives filled with unspeakable joy. Now, I know that surrendering fills us with the spirit of rejoicing, as it frees us from burdens. Finally, I wish I knew that all I needed to live a surrendered life was nothing else but faith. I do not need to pay God to bear my burdens. I do not have to repay Him for taking responsibility for my care. I do not need to fast and pray every night or become the pastor to show my act of surrender. All I needed to do was to have faith. Faith is an anchor. It is the cornerstone of surrender. It is knowing that even amid trials, there is a purpose and a plan. Surrendering to God nurtures and strengthens our faith. It is the steadfast anchor that keeps us grounded during life's storms. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Beloved, committing your life to God is the surest way to have all the desires of your heart. Looking for an effortless way to achieve success? Surrender. Looking for a risk-free investment with the highest returns? Surrender. Are you searching for ways to achieve your goals? Why not surrender? No matter the situation you're going through, God is inviting you to dine with Him tonight. He requests you come with the list of all your burdens and lay them on His table. He is ready to give you peace, satisfaction, and strength to keep fighting on if only you will trust Him enough to do as He says. Surrendering to God is a journey of intimacy, trust, and faith that leads to a life of peace, purpose, and freedom. Will you let go of everything and surrender today? Do you struggle to know or discern God's will? You've been taught as a believer that it's very important to walk in God's will. You sincerely desire to walk in His will, but you struggle to identify His will from other options crossing your path. You find it hard to determine whether you are truly in God's will. Sometimes you prayed and thought God led you to do a particular thing, only to eventually realize that it wasn't God at all. Of course, that can be frustrating, but don't be discouraged, beloved. In this video, we look at three revealing signs that indicate you are in God's will. The first key sign to know that you are in God's will is that your decisions will have a root in the Bible. Yes, the Bible has directions and instructions for every aspect of life. The Bible is God's word that contains His will. So when your life and decisions align with the Bible, you can be sure you are in God's will. God doesn't want you to second guess your decisions or try to believe whether you are right or wrong. He's made his will so clear and when you walk with him closely, you will find out that knowing God's will is not as hard as you have thought it to be. Because he has made the Bible so open and available to everyone, he also gives you the Holy Spirit to teach you all things and bring you into truth. Many people might say, but the Bible doesn't specifically say I should start a business or get a job or go for another degree. How then do I know what God wants me to do? Well, the answer to that is still in the scriptures. But the problem most times is that believers don't study the word of God to know God. They don't stay with the word of God enough for them to know that it is meant to guide them to God's will. Many people only read the Bible because they have been taught to do so. When you ask many of them, why do you read the Bible? They simply give you some generic answers. When you submit your life to God's Word, then your life will reflect God's will. Reading the Bible doesn't only fill your head with scriptural knowledge, it does something to your mind, making you more in tune with God's will. The Bible says in Romans 12:2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This transformation comes from the power of God's Word. So don't ever think that reading or studying the Word of God is a waste of time or only meant for pastors and preachers. No, it is for you as a child of God. So you know you are in the will of God when what you perceive as God's will aligns with God's Word on every parameter. When your life is in God's will, it will be different from the world. Your life cannot be in sync with the world and you say you are in the will of God. This is another key sign to know that you are in the will of God. Your decisions will be different from the world. The inspiration behind that desire will not be for selfish reasons or worldly desires. Whatever it is you perceive as God's will, if the motive behind it can be traced to the world or worldly patterns, that clearly indicates that it was driven by lust and cannot be God's will. So beyond the actions or plans, whatever you believe is God's will, check your motives. Scrutinize why you want to do it. Do you want it to make a name for yourself? Do you want it to show off? Do you want it to prove a point or silence your enemies? When you can see that you don't desire them for worldly pleasure or personal gain, you can then truly confirm that you are in the will of God. Another revealing sign that you are in the will of God is that you will have peace of mind concerning that situation. Thinking about that decision or step you're about to take will not make you panic or agitated. Even when you don't understand the logic behind it, you just feel calm and peaceful about it. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This peace is not something you can conjure together or talk yourself into. It is beyond you and not something you can even understand because it is divinely inspired by the will of God. The Bible says it transcends all understanding. This indicates that when you don't have peace in your heart concerning a particular thing, it is not God's will. Mary was a young lady betrothed to Joseph. She was happily looking forward to her wedding day when an angel visited her. The angel informed her that she would be pregnant and have a son who would be the savior of the world. Of course, that was God's will. But the first question Mary asked was, how shall this thing be? Because humanly speaking, what the angel said was impossible. You might also get to that point where you just can't wrap your head around what God wants you to do. That's because God's ways are higher than yours and his plans are greater and better than anything you can carve out for yourself. When you don't need faith to believe something, it's most likely because your brain is calculatively working things out. If truly it is God's will, you will require faith to believe it. Mary went from how shall this thing be to be it unto me according to your word. The Bible even says that she kept the sayings in her heart. That could have been because she knew it would be hard for others to believe it. She believed everything God said even though it had never happened before. She knew that as long as God had said it, He would make it happen if she aligned herself with His will. You need faith to believe whatever God has revealed to you. If you don't act in faith and trust God, you may not see the result God has promised you which might make you start doubting if what you heard was God's will. Noah was another person who got an unusual assignment from God. It was God's will for him to build an ark and keep telling the people that rain would fall. Remember, before then, they had never experienced rain on earth before. Can you imagine how ridiculous he would have looked standing before all those people and telling them rain would fall? Do they even understand what it means to rain? No wonder they scorned him. That was not the only unusual part. He had to build an ark, something he had never seen before. That's a great task right there. But just as it is with doing God's will, it will be something beyond your mind. God inspired him to build the ark. He was on the project for 120 years. He had to plant the trees he used for the ark and followed God's precise process. How much faith he must have needed to do that. To truly walk in God's will is beyond knowing. You must be ready to do what God has asked. In Noah's story, the Bible mentions that Noah did all that God had commanded him. That is walking in God's will, doing everything without leaving anything out, whether convenient or not, that God has instructed you to do. While walking in God's will, you need to keep your faith in God intact because that will help you move and do what you are expected to do. Every true believer should always seek to do God's will 
and always desire God's will to come to pass. When the disciples went to Jesus to ask him to teach them to pray, Jesus gave them a pattern to follow. One of the first few sentences of the prayer, known as the Lord's Prayer, is your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6.10. This is the importance Jesus attached to God's will. So if you already desire to know and walk in God's will, it is a noble desire. However, you should know that just because something is God's will does not mean there won't be challenges and storms on the way. One day, Jesus told the disciples they should arise and go to the other side, while on the sea, they experienced a great storm, even though it was God's will for them to take that journey and go to the other side. It was God's will for Mary to have Jesus without any man's influence, but that almost cost her her engagement. She couldn't even defend herself because who would have believed her if she said she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit? That is what walking in God's will entails. With all these signs, you can confirm you are in God's will. When you know you are in God's will, you will surely know that God is by your side. Because can you be doing his will and he will abandon you? No, that's the answer to that. And when he is with you, can any devil defeat you? No. So fear not and launch out because God is with you and will help you. He will give you the strength to do all he wants you to do. Knowing and walking in God's will is essential for believers to live the best life above average and maximize everything God puts within them. It brings peace and assurance. So if you are unsure whether you are in God's will, prayerfully look at the sign shared in this video. And don't forget, aligning with God's will is a journey and requires humility, obedience, and reliance on Him. Stay close to Him, seek His guidance, and trust that He will lead you in His perfect will. Amen.